thank you very much, and welcome to everybody out there all over the world. It's um, uh, over the last few weeks, this has been an odd, uh, an odd experience for all of us who practice in this space. Understanding that the sanctions area may be very active, and we might uh, have lots of work to do, and very much hoping uh, that it would not be the case. Uh, but we are where we are, and uh, we've been working with our clients over the last 10 days or so all uh, all, all around the world uh, and thought it would be good to get on and uh, obviously do a recap of, of, sort of where we are um, and how we got here, uh, share some of the issues and the challenges that our clients um, and friends are facing out there in this space all over the world, uh, and then open it up for Q&A. Uh, hope, hope, hoping we can have something of an interactive discussion with what is already quite a big group. Uh, Format-wise, we very much want this to be uh, an interactive discussion, so please don't feel like you need to save your questions, um, uh, questions and comments to the end of the program. Uh, if you send them through, we'll address them in real time. Um, and, uh, and, and your questions really are welcome at any time. Uh, you can advance. So the first thing that we'll do today is, you know, I will do, we'll, we'll do some quick introductions and then we'll jump right right into it and talk about sort of where we were not very long ago, only a week and a half ago, um, where we are today and how we got here. Uh, I think we can learn a lot from uh, the policy responses of the various uh, jurisdictions that are imposing economic sanctions on the Russian Federation. Learn a lot about what the policy preferences are by just looking at the timeline uh, and parsing through the differences. Uh, the different measures that each of them have enacted and, and in particular, uh, in what order. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, a number of the issues that we're working with our clients with you know, every day in real time, because uh, I think there are some real interesting practical challenges that we can share with the group. Um, and then we'll do some prognostication and think to ourselves, uh, what's coming next? Uh, where could this go from a, a practical, factual matter um, with events on the ground and what might that mean for all of our practices and all of our businesses going forward. Um, let me first introduce myself. I'm Tom Best. Uh, I'm a partner in Paul Hastings Washington office and I spend most of my professional life doing a couple of things. One is advising large companies and financial institutions on all manner of, sort of cross-border compliance risks, be they sanctions, export controls, money laundering, and anti-corruption issues. Uh, and hoping that they don't get in trouble in the first place, and um, spending an awful lot of time sometimes uh, cleaning up the mess and hoping that uh, in investigations and enforcement cycles, uh, you know, in, uh, when um, when things potentially have gone wrong uh, as a defense lawyer. Let me introduce my colleagues Ben Dainim and uh, Arun Sevastava, and they'll talk about themselves for a second here too. Uh, thanks, Tom. I'm Ben Dianini. I, like Tom, am based in the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, I've been uh, practicing in the sanctions and export control space for about 25 years, along with uh, practices in fintech and payments and privacy and cybersecurity. A lot of the work that I have done does focus on the payments or financial services sector, but not exclusively. We have also worked in a variety of tech and other um, settings, telecommunications and others. Um, and um, I, uh, my practice consists of compliance advisory work as well as investigations, voluntary self-disclosures, and the like. Uh, and as Tom, to echo Tom's sentiment, it has been um, an incredibly busy uh, couple of weeks with all kinds of questions coming in from a variety of sectors, and I'm looking forward to discussing those with everyone today. Uh, thanks, Ben. I'll go next. Uh, my name is uh, Aaron Shrivastava. I'm a partner at Paul Hastings' office in London. Uh, my practice focuses on financial regulation, including financial crime issues, embracing uh, sanctions and AML matters as well. Uh, I'm here representing the UK, but also the European Union, in spite of Brexit for current purposes. I think what, one of the themes that possibly will emerge as we talk through the slides is that the the UK's regime, uh, financial sanctions and sanctions regime, uh, has been based on the European Union's uh, financial sanctions and, and broader sanctions re regimes. But since uh, Brexit, the UK has its own domestic uh, financial sanctions and broader sanctions program, which is closely aligned to the European Union, but, but there are some differences in emerging. And over to you, Tom. 
Great. Thanks. And if you could uh, advance the slides to number seven. I think it's useful to take a step back here and think about where we were only maybe 10, you know, 10 days ago, um, how we got to that point and how quickly things have evolved um, on multinational fronts uh, in the U.S., the EU, and the U.K. Uh, you can go ahead to, to slide eight. Um, we all, and I'll talk about this chronologically just to, to set the stage here. Um, you know, in, in 2014, we obviously had what we now can look back and say was perhaps the first round of the, the events that are going on right now. Um, it was obviously a li limited uh, invasion or annexation of Crimea uh, and some incursions into the eastern part uh, of the Donbass, uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, and in response to that, we had some fairly, you know, what now look like limited sanctions in the U.S., um, and primarily you know, with some individual SDN designations and then primarily some sectoral sanctions, um, uh, you know, restricting access to capital for, uh, you know, for the, a lot of the Russian financial institutions, uh, but also in the oil and gas and other extractive sectors. Um, relatively similar um, relatively similar measures in the EU, uh, and the UK didn't have its own regime uh, at that point. You can go ahead to nine. Um, that said, as things started to move back 10 days ago or so, um, and we'll talk about each of these in, you know, in detail as we talk about some of the challenges that we're facing, um, you know, we ended up with a full embargo uh, from the US and the EU perspective. Um, uh, on the uh, on the so-called People's Republics of the, of Donetsk and Luhansk, um, really importing or transporting the Crimean uh, embargo sanctions re regime into those two uh, into those two regions, and that was really done on a multilateral basis, right? U.S., EU, U U.K., along with a whole bunch of additional uh, individual designations, but now with a clear focus on the Russian financial sector and the beginnings of beginning to starve the state, or an attempt to starve the state by the U.S. at least, uh, of its ability to fund itself. Um, go ahead, uh, you can go, can, you can, 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 can go to 10. Um, at that point, and it seems like we're a long way from that right now, it, it, there was certainly a lot of political discourse here in the U.S. about why the Biden administration had not been more aggressive in particular with respect to um, uh, in particular with respect to the Russian energy sector. And at that point, in particular the EU, in particular the German, uh, the German authorities were strongly resisting uh, cutting off oil and gas exports or hampering them, including the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, it seems like an awful long way uh, politically, uh, foreign policy-wise and other ways now, but it was a fairly dramatic development not eight days ago or nine days ago on the 23rd of February when the Germans refused to certify the pipeline uh, and the U.S. then, you know, put a full SDN designation on its parent company, which um, absent now dramatic changes in the situation on the ground and an awful lot uh, will almost certainly, I think, we, we think stay in place, probably indefinitely. Uh, it would be very hard for us to see how you would get a um, – uh, the political will in the United States to to change that decision, um, to reverse it. Um, you can go ahead to uh, the 24th. Uh, we began to see as um, uh, as the invasion, as the particular prospect of invasion became uh, yeah, uh, more concrete. Uh, additional designations, additional uh, of individuals, uh, and of some Russian financial institutions. Uh, and then a number of different um, SDN designations of financial institutions and beginnings of different restrictions in the U.S., the EU, and the U.K. based on each jurisdiction's policy preferences. And, you know, we can talk in detail for hours, but I'll highlight just a couple uh, from a macro perspective. One is the obvious uh, attempts by all three sets of authorities to protect oil and gas imports and the ability to pay for those oil and gas imports into the European Union pri primarily. Um, uh, and protect the financial institutions in, in, the, uh, in Russia and their ability to process them. Um, and while at the same time, and Ben's going to talk in particular about some of the export control measures that have been taken in the U.S., uh, in particular, and then, but then an, an effort 
to restrict, to begin to restrict um, Russian access, not just to Western capital, uh, but also technology. And so what we've seen, even up to this point, and we've seen uh, you know, certainly in the, the day since then, is a creeping and incremental, based on facts on the ground, response to each additional escalation, but in a very short period of time, and you can go ahead and flip all the way to, um, and go ahead to, uh, just go back one. Thanks. In a very short period of time, some of the most unprecedented um, economic sanctions on a G20 or you know, a significant world economy that have ever been uh, ever been implemented. Um, I do a lot of work in the financial sector around Europe, and in speaking to traders, uh, what is interesting to hear when we're on real-time calls trying to figure out problems is the following statement. Um, legal restrictions being what they may, Russian equities, Russian debt, even if you legally can comply with the restrictions that are in place, say that it's old debt or old equities, um, the markets are, ba are, are barely or not functioning because of the scope of capital restrictions um, uh, and, of, uh, and, uh, and the restrictions on just economic activity uh, and the fear, for, frankly, of compliance issues um, that almost the entire Russian economy is facing. So we've quickly gone from a place to sum up, and I'm going to turn it over to Ben and, and Aaron in a minute, quickly gone from a place where we had a sort of incremental policy response to something that is approximating a potential, uh, in fact, if not in law, potential complete shutdown um, and cutting off of the Russian economy um, you know, from Western capital markets and uh, Western economic um, activity. Quite dramatic. Let me say that. Ben, I think it'd be great if you could jump in and start, and I think we're all just going to share some some experiences that we've had over the last few days. Why don't you jump in from a U.S. perspective and talk about some of the issues that are coming up? And Arun, you can do it after, and then I'll share some of mine because we're all playing in different, um, you know, we're all advising different kinds of clients around the world. Sure, Tom. Should, should I walk through the export control restrictions first and then talk about some of the practical issues, or do you want to talk about the sanctions piece and then we'll do the export? Uh, why, why don't you go ahead with, with export control, because I think it's an important piece of the overall picture. Okay, so let's do that, and then yeah, then, and then we can sort of step back up and talk a little bit about some of the, some of the ways this is manifesting. So, so in addition to the sanctions that, that, that Tom was walking through um, a moment ago, at, you know, on the financial sector and on um, uh, the ability of uh, money to move back and forth uh, between Russia and the global economy, uh, there also has been a very concerted effort to wield the export control tool as a way of choking off um, the flow of technology and of goods and services to the Russian economy. And that really has taken a few forms. The first, uh, I think, first both chronologically and also sort of conceptually um, measure that was enacted was really simply um, uh, to put um, Donetsk and Luhansk on the same footing as Crimea, essentially prohibiting the export um, or re-export of any item subject to the Export Administration regulations, subject to the EAR, which means, broadly speaking, U.S. origin items to those regions, just as has, as has been the case in Crimea. That actually is easy to say. It's harder to actually implement in many cases, especially when we're dealing with online types of transactions. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But that, at least conceptually, is a very simple, straightforward, and sweeping prohibition. Secondly, and far more significantly, um, sorry. Oh, secondly, far more significantly, um, we also imposed uh, prohibitions on export or re-export of items to Russia that are subject to the EAR and classified under certain ECCNs, certain export control classification numbers on the com on the commerce control list. I, I don't want to get overly technical, although I'm happy to if people have questions, but essentially a broad swath of items, um, the more sophisticated items that one might export, are prohibited for export or re-export to Russia. Now, there are some exceptions, some important exceptions to that uh, prohibition. For example, um, uh, encryption items that are exportable pursuant to something called license exception, exception ENC can still be exported to non-government end users and non-state-owned enterprises. Also, there's a license exception for consumer communications devices, which covers mass market consumer types of devices like mobile phones and television sets and things like that. Um, those also can continue to be exported. 
a law as long as they are to consumers and again not to government agencies or certain other government sponsored entities but nonetheless that is a very um, significant restriction on trade to Russia. Aaron do you want to talk a little bit about the UK and the EU? Yeah sure the, um, the position in the EU and the UK is that the restrictions that were imposed back in 2014 and Tom, Tom was uh, relating in his introduction have been broadened out and a lot of the uh, trade restrictions that were imposed at that time focused on the energy sector and also on um, military use or dual use equipment that was that was intended for, for military use and so I think it's a common theme uh, with uh, the, the recent developments is that Previously, the, the sanctions, whether they were trade, trade related or financial related, were actually the, the, the governments had tried to be focused on certain sectors that one could say had a, a specific connection either with the um, political issues in, in play, i.e. of military nature, or, or to do with the Crimea region, for example. Uh, or obviously in the energy sector, the source of funding for uh, Russia's activities. But what's happened now is that the uh, certainly in the UK and I think the European Union as well, the the intention is to, bro to broaden that out and not and and not to try and um, you know, target the trade sanctions to, for example, military use uh, equipment or or, or uh, technology that, that is being used for military purposes, but to try and hurt the Russian economy generally by choking off the supply of um, you know, tech technology in particular that the Russian economy more broadly, irrespective of the sector that the, the, the um, economy is engaged in, is dependent on external foreign sources for, for, that, for that technology. So for example, um, in, the, in the UK, the trade uh, restrictions previously related to you know, military uh, technology and that terminology is now being changed in the UK uh, sanctions to uh, technology or, or goods that are related to any, any critical industry. And that's very broadly defined in, in the UK regulations in quite some detail to cover a, you know, a very broad range of technology. What, what the government has said is that the government consent in the UK to ban the export of, of a range of high-end and critical technical equipment and components in sectors including electronics, communications, and aerospace. So the idea is very much to hurt, um, you know, we, we can agree or disagree about the, the intentions, uh, whether they're, they're valid intentions, but certainly the, the explicit intention of the uh, state by the UK government is to, is to hurt the Russian economy gen generally and move away from the more targeted approach that had been taken in, two, in 2014. Thanks. And one one of the areas is tech, one of the specific areas is tech, technology that the Russians are perceived not to be able to develop themselves and be dependent on you know other countries for. That's actually a great to question to the next slide, Aaron. Uh, the foreign direct product rule. If we can advance the slide. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and talk about that, and then I'll jump in because we've got a couple of questions that I'd like to answer, and that'll kick off into so that, you know into our experiences. Excellent. So along the theme of you know trying to choke. The Russian ability to to in, to move forward in technology and to and to um, to drive technological advancement. The foreign direct product rule is one of the most potent tools the U.S. has, um, and we're wielding it quite uh, aggressively at the moment. Um, and the reason why it's so potent is because so much of the world's, among other things, semiconductor capability um, is predicated upon U.S. origin equipment or software or technology, even when the the manufacturers themselves are offshore that imposing a limit on economic chain production can stifle the ability to supply the Russian economy. So in essence, what the foreign direct product rule says is that um, items that uh, are manufactured abroad uh, that ordinarily would not be subject to U.S. export restrictions can become subject to U.S. export restrictions if they're produced um, using U.S. origin technology or software, or even if they're the direct product of a facility, a plant, or a major component of a plant that is a direct product of U.S. origin software or technology. And the rule has been in place for quite some time, um, but in, historically it's been confined to um, very specific circumstances. More recently, it was brought in to address the Huawei. Uh, the U.S. applied the foreign direct product rule in a way to try to 
to, to limit the supply of chips to Huawei. And now we're seeing actually it being applied to an entire country, to Russia, in a very sweeping way. So, in, so what the rule says right now is that if you have an item that's uh, the direct product of U.S. origin software technology that has an ECCN in those that you see on the slide there, in that range, in categories three to nine, which again is a very, they're, just for, by frame of reference, there are 10 categories on the commerce control list, zero to nine. So this is three to nine. Um, if so if it's on that, if it's in that range, um, then it will be subject to the foreign direct product rule and not the export, that, that end component won't be exportable to Russia. There's even more stringent exception of restriction for items that are going to designated Russian military end users. There, it doesn't matter what ECCN, the, uh, the U.S. origin software technology is subject to. If it's U.S. origin, then that's going to trigger that control. And, and, and so, again, the, the, the aim here is to prevent supply of items to, the Russian, to Russian technology companies. And we've already seen that in, in effect um, in our practice because we've seen letters from non-U.S. manufacturers, semiconductor manufacturers, to clients saying we can no longer supply you with these chips because we understand the products they're intended for are destined for the Russian market. So it's interesting that, that, that that's a good segue. Thank you. It's interesting that we're talking about um, economic restrictions here for, on technology that can operate in certain areas, in particular with higher tech consumer goods and other things, um, can operate as something of, a, of an embargo, right? They have quite significant restrictions, um, quite significant effects over time. What we don't have uh, with respect to Russia, at least not yet, um, is an overall economic embargo. Um, and I, that brings us to the first uh, first question that we've got here. First question that came in from the audience says, following these sanctions, can U.S. and U.K. private equity funds invest in European headquarters businesses whose shareholders are Russian or Belarusian nationals? Um, the short answer to that question, and I'll sort of answer it in the, in, uh, in the abstract first, is what we don't have yet is any sort of embargo or any sort of prohibition on dealing with Russian companies or r Russian individuals writ large. Um, in order to have this problem, you still need to have individuals or companies or entities that are on a list, be it the FDN list or the EU sanctioned parties list or the UK sanctioned parties list. Um, and so as a general matter, US and UK private equity funds have no restrictions on um, uh, on investing in businesses that have Russian, Belarusian nationals as shareholders. Now I'll say that, you know, that said, one of the things that I think we're hearing, uh, I am hearing every day in every client call, is an extreme uh, aversion to risk. Uh, and you've seen in the press, uh, and, and, and I should say probably perceived risk. Uh, and you'll all see in the press that lots and lots of U.S. and uh, EU and other companies, uh, based companies, are deciding to wholesale pull out of the Russian market. Um, notwithstanding the fact that there's no legal bar uh, to operating in those markets. And so we're getting this question a lot, actually. We're spending a lot of time working through the different requirements. If you do have a Russian or a Belarusian or a somebody else national who's on a designated sanctions list, uh, working through their shareholdings, working through recusal mechanisms, working through other kinds of things you need to do in order to make the businesses that they may own or have owned or controlled um, saleable uh, or investable, but the um, the story in the market, right, and those restrictions have been in place for a long time. We've got new people coming in, but the story in the market that I'm seeing with respect to private equity is wholesale de-risking and unwillingness to, to be able or to want to uh, do business with people who they even might perceive to be connected to the Russian regime or Russian business or Russian billionaires, and that's creating um, a huge capital drain, you know, out of Russian business in, uh, in particular. I don't know, Ben, Aaron, well, what are you guys saying on that front? So, so I, I agree. I, I, we're seeing the same kinds of things at the operational level, too, with businesses trying to decide what their approach is going to be. And really, I think there are three sets of factors. One is de-risking, as you, as you point out, and that in itself has two components to it. Um, on the one hand, there's a compliance concern that I see on the part of compliance officers and general counsels. Um, they're, they're not always confident in the ability of their existing compliance structures to distinguish what's seen permitted and prohibited activity in this rapidly evolving environment where you, do, where you have to make um, sometimes 
difficult distinctions among what's permitted and what's between what's permitted and what's prohibited. So in some cases, the decision is, well, we're just going to stay out of it altogether because the risk of making a mistake is too high. At the same time, there's also another aspect of de-risking, which is, well, this is the sanctions today. We know there are already far more draconian than they were a week ago. Who knows what will be in two weeks? Do we really want to be able to? Do we want to? Do we really want to continue in this sector? Um, is it worth the trouble when in a week we might have to pull out anyway? So I'm seeing a lot of that. And then some companies are also evaluating. You know, do we want to take a political stand on this, a policy stand, um, a, a principled stand? And without addressing the merits of that one way or the other, we're seeing some companies are saying, yeah, we do, and we're and we're and we're we're not going to engage in activity even if it is legally permissible. Others are taking a different principle and, and, and stand and saying our our view is that that you know doesn't serve a public policy goal that the, that if that were intended if that were the desired outcome on the part of the U.S. and the European governments then they would prohibit it and taking that step might have other unanticipated negative impacts on ordinary people for example in Russia and so we're not going to take that step and I think that there are you know valid considerations on both sides and companies are coming out uh, differently on that. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, why don't you, yeah, yeah. you you jump in because I've got some other thoughts as well. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I, I think uh, in particularly in the private equity area, I think Ben made an important important point, which is that the the, the scope of these sanctions is rapidly evolving, and typically, uh, you know, in a private equity context, you may be holding on to that asset, a port, you know, shares, invested in a portfolio company for uh, you know a, a period of time. So, uh, and and it may be less liquid. Uh, so you do run the risk of it, it being okay today, but not 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 when you come to exit. And I, I think in the what, one thing to bear in mind is that the the UK, for example, has uh, massively expanded the designation criteria. That is the criteria that allows the UK government to uh, you know, designate a person as a sanctions target. And now you can be previously you you kind of have to be interfering in something to do with the Crimea or have a military or political connection. But now the UK can designate as a, uh, a target anyone who supports or obtains a benefit from the Russian government, which could be the entire Russian population, potentially. <laughs> so, I mean, so the, the, they've given themselves massive leeway to, to designate. Uh, and we can see, you know, the longer this conflict goes on, the more and more people are going to get designated. I think the, the assuming that the... Um, you know, the, the, the shareholder in the, the target portfolio company is not presently designated. Certainly in the UK and EU, you, you, would, have the, you would have the issue of, um, you know, whether, whether you could acquire um, transferable securities, shares in a, in a company that is owned by uh, a Russian person, full stop, irrespective of whether they are designated or not. So one of the changes that's been made, certainly in the UK, is to say that the capital market restrictions, which prevent the acquisition of shares uh, by, by a, a person subject to, to the UK regulations, applies not, not just in relation to, say, um, shares issued or, or bonds issued by a designated Russian bank, such as VTB, but it now applies in relation to the Russian government but uh, also to any, any shares or securities that are issued by any person connected with Russia of, uh, in relation to securities which have been issued after the 1st of March. So basically any Russian company or person uh, is, uh, would be off limits in relation to their securities issued after the, the 1st of March 2022. So you don't, you know, you don't have to be a designated bad guy in Russia to, for there, there to be a problem with having this sort of uh, financial financial arrangement. That's a, quite, quite sweeping um, and quite interesting. Um, ben, you raised a really interesting question at the, at the outset of uh, what you just said, that you know, one, one of the uncertainties and one of the, the, the dynamics that's driving de-risking is compliance risk. And while the law may be clear or clear-ish, um, the ability to actually implement controls in order to ensure compliance um, when things are evolving this quickly uh, is an operational challenge, in particular when you're talking about large enterprises or large financial institutions. You know, I, the, one of the questions that we've gotten 
from a number of different institutions really across the European continent is, well, how do we deal with the embargo, you know, with the restrictions on the new parts of Crimea, but then also the new parts um, of Luhansk and Donetsk, where what I need to be able to do in order to be lawfully remitting um, uh, or allowing remittances of salaries, whatever they, they may be, um, how do I figure out who's on what side of the right line, um, you know, in those two areas? And for our clients, that's, for a number of them, it's thrown up some really interesting issues that are quite difficult. On the one hand, it is much easier to say when a lot of our clients sort of have a, um, uh, have a population of payments that they can track over time into the Ukraine where they can identify addresses for the most, but not all of them, so they can have some verifiable facts where they're able to say, okay, I know this person is not in those two areas, and, and I know that these people potentially are in those two areas. Um, and they block those that may be in the, you know, they block, um, block dealings with those who may be in the, the sanctioned areas. But for some chunk of their, uh, of their clientele, uh, they're unable to pinpoint it, so they have some compliance risk. And the question is, well, what do you do? Um, the easy answer to that question for, for a number of, of our clients has been we cut them off. But that is, as folks have thought through this, um, is an unsatisfactory answer in a, if, if, for a lot of institutions for a lot of different reasons. Um, it, you know, a lot of clients, especially with you know, the ESG movement, which has you know, changed the landscape quite significantly of how we think about these kinds of business problems, um, a number of our clients have come to us and said, well, help us weigh the compliance risk versus you the genuine human rights and ethics risks, reputational risks of cutting off payments to people who maybe now more than ever um, need to be able to go buy food, need to be able to get cash out of the bank, get the, and, and drive to Romania, uh, or whatever it may be. And so you know, I, I can contrast our experience even from five years ago dealing with these kinds of issues um, in that the landscape of the considerations that we're taking into account are much more complex than they were, and they're frankly not strictly legal. But they're really, the point of departure is what can we do on a risk-free basis from a compliance perspective, and then we layer on all these different issues. Yeah, so that's a great, great question, and, and you're right, it's a very difficult issue. And let's focus on payments, because I think it's a great, it's also a, it's a, it's a crystallizing example of some of the problems. And maybe if we advance the slide, it will lead us right into a, a piece of the issue, dealing with cryptocurrencies, although that's not the entire issue. Um, so. So um, first, before we even get to Russia, um, there's the issue of, of Donetsk and Luhansk, right? And, um, and, and companies that, that transact online, that engage in online activities, whether it's payments or other activities with people in those regions, are faced with a very difficult challenge because it's not always easy. In fact, it's often not easy to um, identify whether somebody's in a sub-national region of a country. It's one thing to, for example, geolocate and block all IP addresses associated with Iran. It's a country that has IP addresses, they're known, they change over time, but you, keep, you can subscribe to a vendor or keep track of what the IP addresses are with a fairly high degree of confidence, not 100%, and block that area. When you, when you get down to the sub-national level, it's not so easy. Over, that, was, it, that presented a significant problem with Crimea when the Crimean sanctions were first enacted. Over time, companies have developed solutions in, some, in many cases to deal with that. Now those solutions have to be adapted and applied to two more regions of Ukraine. So that's a challenge. More broadly, looking at Russia, where there is not, as we've already said multiple times, a blanket prohibition on all dealings of all Russian citizens, it becomes even more difficult at times, not necessarily because you're not sure who the person is with whom you're dealing, although that can be an issue in the consumer context, for example. But often, it's, you know the person. They're a contractor, or they're a party with whom you've had dealings in the past. And it's perfectly legal for you to deal with them. But the banks aren't processing the payments because the Russian counterpart banks are blocked, um, or the U.S. bank is just de-risking. So what do you do? So a lot of um, a lot of our clients have been looking at the possibilities presented by crypto and whether wondering whether perhaps they can make payments through crypto exchanges, through the use of cryptocurrencies, um, which are not subject to the same issue right now because the financial institutions are not you know are, they don't need the financial institutions that are being blocked, and and so. What we, what we generally discussed when talking to clients about the pros and cons of that, there are a number of considerations. 
there are, first of all, there are tax and accounting considerations, which is outside the scope, at least for me. Maybe Tom or Aaron can address that. Um, but from a, from a legal and regulatory perspective, there are a number of implications. Um, but uh, there are a few sort of guiding principles. The first is you, you can't use crypto to do something that is prohibited you know, otherwise. The, the crypto is not a law-free world. Um, you, cryptocurrencies are treated in the United States and in Europe as currencies, and the right restrictions that would apply to a fiat transaction would apply to a crypto transaction. So, so you can't look at it as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Um, what that means is that, but on the other hand, if something is permitted and you simply as a practical matter are not, are not able to do it because the bank's not willing to do it um, or because the, the parties that are involved in the traditional financial system are prohibited individually, there's nothing that prohibits you from using an alternative method. Just like you could, um, although uh, it would probably not be practical, mail a check to someone in Russia, right? You can send Bitcoin to someone in Russia if the transaction is legitimate and the person is permitted. But what we've been, what we've been advising clients who are thinking about doing that is to use licensed exchanges because you don't want to use an exchange that operates outside the law. And the United States, anyway, the crypto exchange is offering crypto fee to fiat conversions and holding funds for U.S. persons. It must be licensed in the United States, registered with FinCEN, and licensed as a money transmitter or an exchange in many states. So you want to use one of those, right? Um, uh, that way, you're not using an illegal actor. And also, frankly, if the law changes, if the sanctions are expanded to prohibit crypto transactions, then that exchange will stop permitting those transactions. So it is an available tool. Uh, but for the reason I just said, it may not always be an available tool. If the sanctions expand, then that method will be no longer available as well. Um, anyway, so, uh, but it's certainly something that people have been looking at as a way of, of, of continuing to engage in transactions that are themselves permissible. Aaron, I'm looking to add from your perspective. Yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. I think the, the position in the, in the UK is, is broad, broadly similar uh, to the US. I think the, the space that this will work in is where, you know, parties have banks which are excessively risk averse and are looking to de-risk and therefore, uh, you know, not, not wanting to uh, understand whether the transaction is legitimate or not and simply imposing some sort of blanket prohibition on, on uh, fiat currency transactions which are not strictly captured by the, by the, by the prohibitions. Um, I think it's worth saying that in relation to designated persons, the, uh, the restrictions in the UK and European Union apply to funds and, and economic resources. So using crypto, if, if the party concerned is subject to sanctions regimes, using crypto will not be legitimate because it will be, although the crypto may not be strictly funds, it would certainly be caught in the concept uh, of, you know, economic res resources. Uh, as, as Ben was saying, in, in, the, in the UK and the European Union, all crypto exchanges are subject to anti-money laundering registration under the, the fifth money laundering directive. And one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, the exchanges need to, to focus on is, Blockchain, blockchain screening. Um, so obviously, you can you can you can have an account on exchange, but you can transfer crypto from a blockchain address into your regulated exchange account, and um, that those transactions will typically be screened by a regulated exchange provider. And the uh, blockchain screening tools that are provided by businesses like Chainalysis analytic are pretty sophisticated and will be able to uh, generally will be able to pick up whether the crypto is coming in from an address that is associated with uh, illicit activity or held by a, a financial sanctions target so I think there is a space for crypto crypto to be used for legitimate transactions where banks are being excessively risk sensitive uh, but caution needs to be exercised because it could be used for illicit purposes, and that could be picked up through blockchain screening tools. No, I mean, it's an interesting question because one of the other things that we're hearing is, well, on the one hand, we can lawfully process transactions. We can't find a bank to do it. Um, you know, we're spending a lot of our time just working out practical solutions um, to these kinds of challenges, um, for sure. We've got another question here. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase, but uh, the question is, um, if you've got a Russian subsidiary, 
uh, with EU or U.S. citizens in the management chain, um, does it mean that the transactions of those subsidiaries, if they touch Russia uh, and they you know, use or touch Russian banks, um, uh, do you run EU or, or U.S. sanctions risk? Aaron, do you want to take the EU, U.K. side sure. and then we'll hit the U.S. side? Yeah, sure. So the scope of the EU and U.K. sanctions applies generally to um, U.K. Uh, or EU nationals or, or com companies. And gen generally, that in, in the context of um, a cross-border setup, so uh, let's say a German uh, business with a Russian uh, uh, Russian business, if that business is structured as a branch of the German or the UK legal entity, it will be subject to the European or UK sanctions regimes because it's the same legal uh, legal entity. However, if it's structured as a subsidiary uh, of the uh, of a European or UK legal entity, albeit one hundred percent owned, but a, se a separate legal entity in its own right established in Russia, then generally, generally speaking, the the European and UK sanctions won't apply to that uh, subsidiary entity in 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 Russia. The next the next issue, which is uh, uh, which is specific, I think a specific issue raised in this question, is if you have a U.S. citizen. Uh, so you, you could have a U.S. or U, uh, I'll leave the U.S. out of it for my co colleagues. But if you had a U.K. or U.S. Uh, national citizen uh, who say is an expatriate living in Russia, who holds a managerial, because you know, is, is a director, CEO, finance director, whatever it is, uh, in in that subsidiary established in Russia, then there is a potential issue for that individual because that that individual being a British or a German national could be subject to the uh, application of the sanctions regimes in uh, in their home country. So, for example, if the subsidiary in Russia was making uh, a payment, paying salaries or making payments or held an account at VTB Bank, which is designated, then that person could be committing a, a sanctions offence under the rules that apply in their in their home country. So I think the best the best approach would be for that person to be recused uh, from involvement in in matters which could be regarded as a uh, sanctions violation if performed by someone who's who is directly subject to the uh, sanctions regimes in the EU or the UK. From a US perspective Ben, you weigh in too, but from a U.S. perspective, I have less concern if you've got somebody who's in a management position and there's payroll being processed by people in the back office you know, and they happen to use VTB, which is a you know, designated SDN, then if you're a U.S. national and you're processing that payroll and you're calling VTB and doing deals with them every day, um, and you're right, there are, we, we, we advise on this, these issues and there are recusal processes, et cetera, but the further away you get from the individual one-on-one -on -one dealings with a designated entity, the better you're going to be from a risk perspective. But, yeah, so I, I agree with that. I would add, I guess, well, maybe a nuance or two. I think it depends on which sanctions specifically are at issue with respect to that financial institution, because there are certain sanctions in the U.S. anyway um, that apply to U.S. financial institutions. So a state bank can't engage with that bank, but don't apply to Ben Dianney, right? So if, that, if that's the particular sanctions that are at issue in, the, in this example, then I wouldn't have a problem as a U.S. management employee of the subsidiary because the sanction doesn't apply to me. On the other hand, there are sanctions that apply to me individually. And in that situation, um, I, I think, Tom, I would agree with you with one maybe additional point, even, you know, additional factor. Yeah, if I'm not involved directly and it's going in the back office, fine. But if it's our, if, but if it's like our um, established counterparty that we know we use for all of these types of services, like payroll distribution, then I would have concern if I were a U.S. energy management in, in, uh, employee in that situation. If I had the ability to do something about it, right? Um, I think that's fair. Management versus middle management. You know, where am I in the in the in the hierarchy? Uh, so anyway, but it's it's a very it's 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 a great illustration of some of the just the pitfalls here uh, as as you try to navigate your way through um, this minefield. 
that yeah, and, and we don't have just that much answers to these questions. Uh, every business has to work through the facts and make risk-based judgments as you go. Um, yeah, we're all working this out in re real time. I've got another. Um, I've got another question. That this has got a crypto angle to it, so I'll put it over to you, Ben. Um, how are clients approaching the trade-off between regulatory risk, i.e., being able to make permitted payments to suppliers, and wider business risk, i.e., the potential for margins to swing with relatively volatile crypto prices? That's a, that is a great question. I, I, I would not purport to speak for businesses generally. Um, I, I will say that I don't, I don't have any clients that I know of that have yet made the determination to switch from a fiat method of payment to a crypto one. I have several considering it, but they haven't done it yet. And, and I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that, that the volatility of the cryptocurrency, the last thing they want to do is pay a supplier, for example, they owe $100,000. And by the time the Bitcoin or the or the ETH or whatever gets to the supplier, it's worth fifty thousand dollars. Now the suppliers say, "Wait a minute, you still owe money, right?" So that's one reason. The other reason is that you know it's not such a simple thing to move to a crypto channel, and it might be only be a temporary solution if sanctions expand. And so there's a lot of thinking about, well, well do we really want to go through all this trouble, both in terms of operational changes, but also you know, risk decisions and management decisions, and then find that we it doesn't ma it doesn't matter because it would have been prohibited anyway. Um, what some clients are doing, and, and actually it's very important before I go to what someone's doing, there's one aspect of, of, of this that's very important to keep in mind. The Russian financial institutions that have been blocked have been blocked. So what that means is if you try to send a transaction through them, it doesn't get sent back to you. It gets mm -hmm. captured by the U.S. financial institution, I presume, Aaron, Aaron, this is true in the U.K. and the U.K., and held. And so you don't have it. So if you, as a U.S. Uh, company, let's say, owe a, vent, a supplier in Russia $100,000, and you try to send it, and the U.S. financial institution sees that it's intended for you know, a bank that's been blocked, it will just keep the $100,000 and put it in a blocked account. Your supplier will not get paid. You will not have the money any longer. And then you're going to be in a kerfuffle with your supplier about this $100,000. And so... I've advised clients that, or you know, in situations like that, to make very certain they know what Russian financial institutions uh, or other financial institutions their suppliers or counterparties are using before they attempt to send the transaction. Once you attempt to send it, it's too late. And if, and if that supplier you or that counterparty uses a blocked institution for its banking, then tell them we can't send the payment now. If you have another financial institution, we have you know, let us know, or we will hold it for you until such time as we can send it. That's very important, and, and if you don't do that, then you might find that you're in a situation where you don't have the funds anymore and still have the obligation. Yeah, yeah we're great. That dynamic a lot. Sorry, Aaron, you go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, I was going to agree with what Ben was saying, that if the funds are liable to be being blocked and put in some sort of internal suspense account at the bank, which could then re report the transaction in the UK to the equivalent of OFAC, OFSI, um, because they, they are under various... Uh, you know, re reporting obligations. I mean, our experience so far has been that, um, you know, payees in Russia are uh, aware, you know, are sensitive to their own banking relationships and whether they, if they're expecting to be paid by a um, customer from outside Russia and they hold an account at VTB bank, VTB bank, they're not going to want to give you that for the same sort of economic considerations, then, you know, someone, they want the money as well <laughs> that, that's been blocked by the bank. So, so what, we, what we have seen is that, um, you know, uh, providing the services in Russia are accepting payment would say, well, could you not pay it to the bank that we normally use? Could you pay it instead to X or Y other bank, which could be, say, uh, a subsidiary or branch of a European bank that, 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 that they, you know, they, there shouldn't be any legal reason why the money shouldn't go there on the basis that the, the, supply, the, the, the payee themselves is not, are not designated. Right, and I'll, just, I'll add just in response to that last question with the, the, the question of how are clients approaching the trade-off between regulatory and wider business risk? Um, what's striking in this market amongst lots of different businesses and lots of different industries is businesses are so many of them that we see are seriously considering taking their risk tolerance in both areas down to very, very low to zero, which is why you're seeing, we've seen, and we, we don't, uh, which is why we're seeing lots of different companies in the press 
saying we're just going to pull out of Russia completely. Um, I think that's unprecedented. I can't think of another time that that's ever happened. Um, yeah, but it is a, you know, in the space of 10 days to a week, um, there's been a total reorientation of companies' risk models and financial institutions' risk models uh, and decision-making processes. It's quite remarkable. Um, Tom, I was yeah, let's, I was yeah. just going to say, sorry, I, I'm sorry, Tom. I was going to say that some the the questioner who had asked the question before about um, foreign entities with uh, uh, Russian entities with U.S. or European managers had asked about the liability. So yeah, just to close that point off. Yes, the, it, in, in, the, in the example that I was giving where um, the activity would be prohibited to the U.S. or European manager, it would be their individual violation, their individual exposure, not, it's not the violation of the Russian subsidiary. That's right. Uh, let's do one, one more, and then we should talk about kind of where this is going, because A, I don't think we know, but B, it's, um, you know, we're seeing lots of different regulatory and, frankly, investigation and enforcement threads come together, uh, and it kind of points the way going forward a bit. Um, the last question was, so what about EU slash UK entities that are regulated in the relevant jurisdictions, but their UBOs are Russian entities and or citizens? Aaron, I think I'll throw that to you. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 could, be, that could be problematic depending on the, the, the status of the UBO or immediate, immediate shareholder. Um, yeah, I, I think there, it, obviously, you need, as Tom was saying at the outset of this discussion, there isn't a an absolute, uh, you know, blanket, uh, you know, sanctions regime against all and all and everyone in, in Russia. But I think the problem that this poses is around, um, you know, that financial institution in the UK or or EU, where it is dealing with uh, naturally dealing with other uh, you know, financial institutions in in the UK or EU market, encountering. Uh, you know, risk of risk aversion, but also um, bearing in mind that, as Ben was saying, you need to look at all the different types of sanctions that, that are imposed. So the UBO might not be a, a designated person in the sense that they may not be subject to an asset freeze, but a uh, you know someone dealing with with that regulated entity with the Russian UBO would need to consider, for example, whether the capital market restrictions would be relevant to the nature of their dealings with the, the reg regulated firm. So, because uh, the, the, the risk, these prohibitions flow down, so if the if the regulated entity is 100% owned by a Russian resident, let's say, then the capital market restrictions, which uh, impose ish, you know, prohibitions around uh, dealing in transferable securities, would be problematic. You also the European Union. There is a, at the European in the European Union uh, sanctions. There is a restriction on sales of euro, euro denominated securities to mm -hmm. Russian persons. So that goes the kind of the other way around. So not only would, might there be nervousness about dealing in securities where the counterparty or the issuer is Russian, but selling uh, a Russian owned business euro, euro denominated assets. Could be could be a sanctions violation as well. So there there are uh, uh, you know a host of issues to consider. I mean the, the other the other I mean the other things to bear in mind also are restrictions in the UK on the provision of correspondent banking services, processing sterling transactions, and the, the provision of financial services uh, to various Russian state entities uh, in relation to management of reserves and asset management. But that, that applies not just to provision of financial services to the Russian Central Bank, but also to the national Russian National Wealth Fund. And the Russian National Wealth Fund, I think, says Sovereign Wealth Fund that owns uh, a number of businesses. And I think they, it's, Sabir Bank, for example, might be owned by. I think there's, there's there's discussion at the moment about well, if the Russian National Wealth Fund is is you're, you're not allowed to provide financial services to them. Then you need to find out who who they own and whether you can then provide financial services to those parties. So there, there's a whole cascade of issues. So you might you might come out of the other end, and, and you know a counterparty to that you, Russian-owned business might think, okay, that's fine. We've we've thought it all through. There's certainly a lot of issues to consider that go beyond the initial point of are they a designated person? Let's um, 
we have two minutes, so we won't take anybody's uh, additional time. But let's let's talk about sort of where this goes. And I'll note two, three things, and I'll leave it to you guys, Ben and Nern, to to um, to close off. Putting my anti-corruption and investigations and enforcement hat on, one of the sort of signature um, signature efforts of the Biden administration since they came in was to talk about na you know, national security in terms of anti-money laundering and anti, uh, their anti-corruption enforcement efforts. Talk about those two areas as national security priorities. Um, I don't think anybody, when they brought that out, brought that policy out, um, was thinking that it would be front and center when we're talking about an invasion, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But here we are. And so you will see, not coincidentally, yesterday, uh, the U.S. You know, in announcing two fairly um, significant efforts. One, there's going to be a brand new DOJ task force to go after circumvention of sanctions, if particularly focused on Russian billionaires and regime officials. And two, uh, we're expecting a bill in Congress today, um, uh, where which will have a apparently going to have a very wide set of designations, uh, not just at the end, not just you know oligarchs and. Uh, and regime officials, but also quite a wide net of their family members and business associates. Um, it, it raises for me, depending on how boots on the ground, and unfortunately it is boots on the ground, and depending on how things turn out, um, raises for me the question, will we end up with a full embargo of uh, the Russian Federation? And, um, the, and I, I think in policy circles, people don't know yet. Um, if the Russian invasion is successful, if we have a full embargo of um, of, uh, of Ukraine as well. Um, I don't know what you guys think, but I think all of these questions that were unthinkable 10 days ago are now on the table. Yeah, no, I, I don't have much to add to that. I, I'll just say that I think in, in response to a question that came in, if, if, if the Russian invasion is successful and they uh, occupy all of Ukraine, I would expect san the sanctions that we see on Crimea uh, Donetsk and Luhansk to extend to the entire uh, country as long as it's under Russian occupation. I would be I would be surprised, frankly, if it didn't. And I do think, Tom, at that point, the comprehensive sanctions against Russia would be on the table. I don't know whether we would do it, but it would certainly be on the table. Yeah, it's on the table. Same same here. I mean, the uh, you know, uh, there's there was the uh, uh, the ratchet in play here, and the worse the situation gets, the the more uh, we can expect. Uh, the governments to come out with. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We're going to keep our promise and keep it to an hour. Um, thank you very much for everybody who stayed, and I um, uh, hope everyone who's got friends, family, business associates in that part of the world that they're all staying safe. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Steve.